This is about the future of FDB storage engines. Uh, my name is Steve Atherton. Uh, I've been, um, oh, let me use this thing. I've been working on Foundation DB for about four years. I've done a bunch of different things, um, but the thing I'm here to talk about is uh, storage engines in general and the Redwood storage engine, which I'm very excited to uh, talk about today. Um, so uh, this presentation is going to hopefully have about four parts and minimal pauses and mistakes made by the speaker. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about uh, storage architecture of FoundationDB, um, and then review current storage engine options, talk about what we'd like to see in future storage engines, and then introduce the Redwood storage engine and some of its technical highlights. Um, so what's an FDB storage engine? So it, its main purpose is to persist uh, keys and values to disk. So it's not distributed. It lives in, it's used by a single process from a single thread. Um, which makes it the most exciting part of this distributed database. Okay, maybe not, but it's really important because about 90% of FDB's uh, of, of an FDB cluster's processes are uh, have storage engines, uh, and the other 10% are designed to funnel data to those storage engines as fast as possible. Um, so I'd l just a little block diagram here. We, ha we have to have one. It, uh, every di uh, you know, there has to be one system diagram in every presentation, I think, is the rule. Uh, so we, so um, this, sh this is showing basically where um, the storage engine fits in uh, to FDB's architecture. So we have this distributed log system, and we have a storage server role. Um, the storage engine lives inside the storage server. Every storage server has exactly one storage engine instance. Uh, the storage server receives mutations in version order, version order from the distributed log system, and it initially writes them to two places in memory, two different data structures. Uh, one is a tree-like thing that lets you efficiently uh, point, read, and range scan uh, values of keys by their version. Or sorry, values. Of, uh, uh, you, sorry, <laughs> you can uh, read read keys and ranges. At a, ver at a specific consistent version uh, and get, of course, their values, which is why you would, never mind. Uh, that was a blunder. <coughs> okay, so uh, the other place that the, uh, the mutations go is uh, uh, a um, structure that stores uh, blocks of mutations ordered by version. And then on a delay, uh, those versions are, uh, uh, those mutations uh, are applied in version order on the storage engine. Um, so I say on a delay because our, our storage engines currently are single version. So once you've written something to the storage engine, you can't read the value that was there before. And so in order to, to support reads during the five second window uh, that, that our transactions live for, um, we, we need to keep that data in memory, which is that little tree structure on the right, um, and not push mutations to the storage engine until they've left that buffer. Then periodically, and in practice, it's one every, once every one to two seconds. Um, we, we commit on the storage engine, and then we send a message to the distributed log system telling it it can forget, uh, the, uh, the, the log it was talking to can forget versions uh, up, up to that committed point. Um, so commits always happen on a clean version boundary. Um, so our current storage engines, uh, there's two of them, um, SSD and memory. So um, on the left, we have um, our uh, SSD engine um, is based on uh, SQLite. So it, it's a B tree on disk, which has a nice property of giving you instant recovery uh, for on, a, on a cold start. Uh, it, and it's, uh, as its name implies, um, you're supposed to use the storage engine only on SSDs. Um, on the right, we have the memory storage engine, which despite its name, does persist data to disk. Um, it exists as essentially a binary tree in memory, um, and uh, it has uh, it, its on disk structure is a rolling log of mutations and snapshots of uh, keys and values from the in memory structure. Um, so, uh, so as a result, it has a slow recovery time from disk. Um, it uh, we recommend using SSDs for the memory storage engine, but you could probably get away with using spinning disks. Um, so that we have these two storage engines, and they're pretty great. So what else could we possibly want? Well, um, three main things. Um, first is read-only transaction lifetimes that are longer than five seconds. Um, so note that this is not going to increase the write transaction length. Um, that's determined by the version interval held in the resolvers. 
Um, and fundamentally, you probably don't want to keep on increasing that number in an optimistic concurrency system because you're, you're going to increase um, the, the longer you let your transactions run, the more likely you are to have conflicts. Um, but uh, the, let's see. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, another thing we want is uh, prefix compression uh, because, as you've seen earlier today, with um, like the document uh, model and the graph model, uh, modeling data models on top of FDB tend to use a lot of uh, common prefix uh, bytes in their keys. Um, We'd also like better performance, um, particularly fewer disk reads per key uh, and more write parallelism, which, are, um, which I'll talk a little bit more ab about later. Um, so regarding um, that, that uh, five second uh, transaction lifetime. So um, one thing we could do, um, which could be done on top of FoundationDB, or it could be done on top of a storage engine by a proxying storage engine that basically turns a single version storage engine like SQLite into a multi-version storage engine, would be a multi-version layer. Um, so basically, you'd store keys as tuples of key and version. Uh, here's a table showing some examples. So we have three keys that were set at different versions, and two of them were cleared. Um, so in this model, um, reading a key becomes a oh, sorry, a weird thing. Uh, in this model, reading uh, a key becomes a reverse range read um, from well, um, basically from the version you want to read plus one, the way our, our, our ranges work, down to the down to version zero for that key with a limit of one. Because you so you're doing a range read, but you really you, you really just want the first result back. Because you you say you want to read A at 50, and you don't actually know where A was last read or cleared, or sorry, set or cleared uh, at. Um, but um, range read performance suffers as you accumulate old versions. So in this example, if I were to range read from A to D at version 30, I would read over six key value pairs and return only one. Um, so, and you also have to scan your entire key space to remove expired versions at some point. Um, so, um, we don't really, so we, we don't want to do that. <laughs> um, we'd like to push uh, multi-version support into the storage engine and do something more efficient. Um, so, in general, uh, FDB storage engine requirements, um, so I'd, I'd like to review this now. So, it has to be an ordered key value store. You, of course, have to be able to uh, read and write keys. Um, you need to support range read uh, in forward and reverse order. Some uh, certain encodings could make reverse odd, uh, you know, awkward. But um, that's the only reason why I bring that up. Um, uh, here's an important one: you need to have fast range clears. Um, so that is to say that your range clear operation um, has to take immediate effect. Um, and not significantly harm subsequent read or, or write latency. It can have um, background work that, 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 that happens later and for a long time, as is the case in our current storage engine. Um, but uh, but the, the clear range can't um, stop or stall the speed at which you can apply mutations to the storage engine. Um, you also need to be able to read data at a committed version. Um, what we have today, uh, you can only read uh, the latest version committed on the storage engine. Uh, but what we want for future storage engines is to be able to read any committed version within some defined, uh, some configured interval. Um, so notably missing from this list of requirements are low commit latency, because our distributed log system provides um, uh, provide, uh, is what determines our commit latency and provides durability for FDB transactions when you commit them. So um, the storage engine isn't involved until later. Um, so we so we can buffer up writes and commit them like uh, per, you know periodically every couple seconds, for example. We also don't need concurrent writers because the storage server is going to apply mutations serially. Um, so there's no need to worry about different threads or different processes accessing. Um, the, the storage engine. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit more about our current SSD storage engine, um, which is based on the SQLite B tree, which notably is not a B plus tree. And so quick review, uh, B, B trees have values inside their internal nodes, and B plus trees do not. Um, the, so as a result, um, B trees uh, tend to have worse branching factor, uh, branching factors than B plus trees. Um, and so we, uh, which in turn, um, well, basically, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. 
Um, <laughs> with a high branching factor, you could hopefully reach a point where um, you only have one out of cache read per, per lookup, per point lookup, which is a great property to have. Um, so SQLite is not optimized for single writer throughput. Uh, every set and clear operation must traverse the tree serially uh, to its target page and then modify it. Um, so as a result, our writer thread, uh, it's really an actor, but I'm calling it a thread, in FDB uh, only has about one outstanding IOP at any given time. Um, and uh, SQLite is also now optimized for large key value pairs. Um, and, it, and it's not designed to be used in an async framework. It's not written for an async framework. So we've adapted it um, using um, libcoro, uh, which is a library for stackful coroutines. Um, and it's kind of, um, it, it's a lot of complexity. And we'd prefer to have a storage engine that was written in Flow. That's not to say that we wouldn't you know, do the same gymnastics again to adapt some other great storage engine. Uh, it's just that, um, you know, uh, uh, right now, uh, sorry, I totally, uh, <laughs> it's just that we're not doing that right now. We, we, we uh, have some uh, ideas in mind for what we want our storage engine to do, and nothing else does it exactly, so we're writing it from scratch. Um, so the first decision to make is, do we want a B tree, uh, or in the, you know, B plus tree, of course, or an LSM? Um, so a B plus tree optimizes for read performance, which is in line with the rest of FDB's architecture. Um, LSMs do usually have fast point lookup um, using probabilistic hints like bloom filters or cuckoo hashes. Um, but uh, range reads are very common in FDB applications, and probabilistic hints are less useful there. But I understand there is research being done in that area. Um, a, a good example of this is non-unique indexes. Um, you'll have some index identifier, some value, and then your primary keys are the last part of that key. So you need to range scan your index name and value to do a lookup in that index um, and get all the primary keys of the relevant records. Um, so without native versioning, uh, like for example, people often ask about RocksDB, without native versioning support, we would need to use something like the multi-version layer uh, on top of that, um, which has the pitfalls discussed earlier. Um, so this isn't to say that an LSM storage engine is a bad idea. It's just, it, it, it's certainly not, and it's a great idea for some workloads. It's just not our focus right now based on what, what our needs are. Um, so, uh, so this brings me to the Redwood storage engine. Um, so it's a version to be plus tree on top of a version to pager. Uh, it persists version history, but it mitigates the inefficiencies of the multi-version layer design. I'll talk more about this later, so at this point I'm just kind of reading bullets to you. Uh, and of course it has uh, key prefix compression, uh, which I mentioned earlier, and I, I'm going to talk about that in more detail later. Um, so a uh, quick review of what a copy on write B plus tree is. Um, so here we have a, a B tree root node, uh, and, and we're going to show the child link uh, of uh, H points to page seven, so there's, there's that child page, and it's in our child page. And so when you want to modify this structure, um, it, you, the, the, the sequence is you um, first copy the page, then you modify it. So here we've, we've added high equals Z uh, at the leaf level, and um, we've copied page 11 to page 25 before we made that modification. Um, so we've done this, uh, and now, we need to make page seven point to page 25. So we have to update the parents pointer, which means we have to copy page seven and, and make the appropriate change. And then we have to do that again all the way to the root. So now we have a new root. Um, and the nice thing about this is we don't have to have a write ahead log because we have not left our data structure in an inconsistent state on disk at any point. Um, the atomic, like the point in time at which all of the new data uh, is visible from the tree is, is that last step where we updated the root. Um, and so this is expensive for random writes because, uh, so if you have a branching factor of 200 to 1 and you have four levels in your tree, uh, if you touch 200 random leaf pages, you're likely going to have to touch 200 random parent of leaf pages to update those pointers because your third level of the tree is also larger than 200 uh, pages. And then probably also most of your second level will change too. So it, it, the problem is, uh, so you get a lot of write amplification, basically. Um, so we can limit the copy on write um, cost using indirection. So here, here I have the same three nodes, the same setup as before. Um, 
And on the right, I'm going to show uh, the same sequence using indirection with a page table. Um, so this page table maps logical pages to physical pages. Um, and so now these same 7, 11 and, uh, page numbers that are in my B tree uh, uh, nodes, um, those are now logical pages instead of physical pages. Um, so whereas on the left, we copied page 11 to page 25 and modified it. On the right, we keep page 11 as page 11. We write it to a new place. Um, and we update the page table to say the new place, the new uh, slot where page 11 is physically located. Whereas on the left, we still have to do the copy, on, up, copy upwards to the root. Um, so Redwood has a versioned pager, um, which is like that page table we just saw, but uh, it also has a version dimension. Um, all, memory, all, all entries of the, of the um, page table are kept in memory at all times, and the on-disk format is, is very much like, in fact, the prototype, it's a, literally exactly the same thing as the FDB memory storage engine. Uh, as a result, recovery from disk is slow, and so to avoid that, um, the in-memory state uh, will be stored in a shared memory buffer that lives, that, that, that um, can survive graceful process exits and restarts, and the new process will just attach to it and use that structure. Um, but of course, if you, um, you know, power down, power off the machine, uh, reboot it, et cetera, um, you're going to have to do a slow recovery from disk. Um, so, the, the, so the version B plus tree on top of this pager um, basically um, it consists of logical pages that are all read at the same version. So there's many, in a sense, there's many versions of the B plus tree. Because if you start at the root and read it at some version, and then read every page below it at the same version, you essentially have a, a like unchanging um, version of the B plus tree, uh, like a snapshot of the entire B plus tree. Um, so within a version, uh, within a page, you can have multiple versions of the same key, but we control the amount of history um, to avoid that, that slow range read effect um, that we talked about earlier, where as you accumulate older data, you're getting less, um, your, your reads are less potent in terms of actual useful results you can return. Um, also, it, it's notable that prefix compression makes this cheaper because if you have, uh, you know, A at 5, A at 10, A at you know, 15, like the A part, you know, it could be some long key, it cancels out, and even the first couple bytes of the version could actually, uh, I'm sorry, not cancel out, but pre prefix uh, out. Uh, uh, so even uh, um, our versions are, um, as Alec mentioned earlier, our versions are actually pretty long. Um, uh, th these versions, uh, for the, well, for the purposes of this interface, it's, they're going to be eight byte versions. Um, and, um, it uh, basically, you know, if you write A three times rapidly, the first few bytes of that version are probably unchanging and then can be borrowed from uh, the earlier uh, node. Well, I'll get in, actually, I'll get into prefix compression more later. Um, getting close to the end. Um, OK, so uh, another property of Redwood is a high branching factor, which, is, uh, which comes, it was as a result of minimal, using minimal boundary keys and having key prefix compression. Um, let's see, okay, next. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is prefix compression um, and, and a little bit about how Redwood does it. Um, so data models on FDB tend to use repeat prefixes. I think I've said that before uh, in the last few minutes. Um, and uh, so string and turning can reduce repeats, but at a cost of additional reads and additional complexity in your application. Um, I'd like to... Um, so uh, ideally, you would like to just keep, you, you, it, it would be better to not have to do any, any string replacements or enumerations and just you know, uh, construct your keys in a way that, that uh, is natural for your data. So um, here we have one option with the JSON model of you can have some key equal to a value of an entire document, or um, you can have uh, what the document layer actually does, which is a bunch of separate keys and values. Uh, one, uh, one key value pair per value in the document. So you can see there's a lot of repeat um, uh, sequences there in those keys. Um, wait, oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, so one way to, to, to do prefix compression is linear. So you basically serialize the sorted set of keys as a prefix length and then a suffix string. Um, and that gives you um, the minimal possible footprint. 
Um, and so here on the right, I'm going to add some links that show um, basically each uh, where each uh, record borrows its prefix bytes from. So as you can see, they're all just every thing, every uh, L, uh, record borrows from the, from the previous record. And therefore, um, to search this structure, um, it's, lin it's, a, it's a linear search because you have to start at the first key and, re and read you know, all of them to get to the last one and actually be able to decode it. Um, so is there a better set of prefix source links? Could we, could we, could we change um, these, borrowing, these prefix borrowings, borrowing relationships to get a better search time? Well, it turns out that we start at the middle and work out. Um, there we go. Uh, if we have some nodes borrow from the middle and then some other nodes borrow from those nodes, uh, we get a set of links that look like this. And then if we redraw those in a different way, this is the same links here. So the dotted lines are showing the prefix source, uh, the, the prefix borrowing source, and the straight lines are the solid lines of the child pointers. We get a binary tree. Um, notably, everything I've added to the binary tree so far uh, borrows from its immediate parent. This last one actually borrows from the root. It skips over its immediate parent. Um, it turns out, and I don't have time to go into um, deriving this, or, um, but it turns out that for any bina binary tree, whether it's balanced or not, um, there is uh, one ideal prefix source in your ancestry, and you can describe it with just one bit. And that one bit is telling you whether you're, uh, whether you're borrowing from your previous ancestor or your next ancestor. Previous means the ancestor on your left that is greatest, and next means the ancestor on your right that is least. Um, this results in perfect prefix compression and, linear, uh, and uh, log n search time. Um, without, I mean, the only additional overhead in this besides the binary tree is your prefix length and that extra bit. Um, so why does this matter? It's not because of space. Um, Non-perfect prefix compression gives you pretty good, uh, gives you a pretty good uh, uh, space saving. Um, it's about predictability because now we can we we can very quickly answer the question: Will this set of keys that I want to add to this compressed page? Fit once I, you know, uh, fit fit in the page with it, which has a fixed size, you know, limit of say 4K. Uh, once they are compressed, um, so that ends up being uh, really useful for for adding to a page. It's also really useful when you have a bunch of sorted data and you want to bulk build pages. You can scan through it linearly and you know exactly where, uh, uh, based on just comparing adjacent prefixes, uh, you know exactly where you can. Uh, um, stop your scan and then build a binary tree uh, because you you know exactly the point where uh, the the compressed form uh, would overfill your page. Um, it turns out that this also works at the B plus tree level. So here I have two pages um, and two B two B plus tree pages w w each with a small binary tree inside it. And if you'll notice in page seven at the bottom. Uh, the left side and the right side and the root of the binary tree don't actually have a previous ancestor or a next ancestor in the binary tree. Um, but it turns out that if you substitute the, the previous uh, key boundary from the parent, uh, uh, from the parent page or the next key boundary, um, it, it actually, it, well, basically you, you, get, you, get, you get exactly the same effect. So if you take a, a bunch of data that's sorted and you build a whole bunch of B tree pages out of it, um, using this this uh, this borrowing bit, uh, you know, using the same single bit uh, precision, you know, borrowing. Sorry, prefix source specifier. That was terrible. Um, then you get um, perfect prefix compression for that tree. Now, note that the, the the tree as a whole is not always going to have perfect prefix compression because um, as, as you um, oh sorry. Thought I put that here. Um, so uh, deletions can cause parent pages that originally had ideal uh, ideal boundaries that the child nodes were borrowing from um, to basically have bytes that the child pages are no longer borrowing because the, the because the items that were uh, that were borrowing the parents bytes have been deleted. Um, so it'll drift over time, but it's uh, again that's not the main purpose, but it's still pretty good compression. 
Um, so that's, that's all I had. Um, sorry, I did run a little bit over. Um, in conclusion, um, Redwood is going to bring uh, longer read-only transactions. Uh, it'll be faster for reading and writing, and it'll be smaller on disk. Uh, it is on master the master branch right now. It's a work in progress. Uh, it's far from finished. A lot of the work done so far has been experimenting. Uh, it has been very experimental and just kind of exploring design choices. There is a lot of check-ins that completely replace the results of other the, the content of other check-ins. Um, but uh, it's um, you know work work is in progress. It's coming along pretty well. Uh, that's that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you.